been about 17 years, day much like today, I was seated in congregation with church family members, brothers, sisters, friends, and we had set a specific time out of the service to pray for the daughter of, of one of our church members. Over the last few months, they had found that she had stage four lung cancer that had spread through both lungs. It was so severe that she was having a test on Sunday morning at the time when we were praying. Mind you, we were praying for God's healing, but we were also praying that she would be able to be in the test study for cancer treatment so that her life would still be a blessing for those that would come after her. The service went on as normal. And then her father received a phone call. I know phones never ring in the middle of church service. But it was one he didn't silence and and he got up and he walked out. A few moments went by and, and he comes down the back of the middle aisle and interrupts the service. Tears are rolling down his face. And he says, I have to share. She doesn't have any cancer. Multiple tests, multiple doctors. Our God is the God of the impossible. I've been blessed to be a pastor at a few different churches, just amazing people everywhere that God's called us. And one of those, we were doing a community celebration and a cookout. We were having a worship service, and and there was a kids program. And we were inviting the entire community out. It just so happened that bordering the, the park where we were having our community service was the town bully. Anybody have those in their neighborhoods? That, that person's just the old curmudgeon that doesn't like anything and gets mad. Well, I was warned, whatever I did, not to go talk to this guy because he would probably cuss me out. And I was also warned that no matter what happened, it was highly likely that that's what he would do during our service on Sunday morning. I'm young, naive, maybe a little bold. Where do you think I go? (laughs) Who are you? I was already thinking. It's positive he didn't start cussing right off the bat. He knew exactly who I was. So uh, I'm I'm the pastor from from the church. We're having a community service. You saw it in your mailbox. I don't know if you saw that, but it'll be here. I explained it. I I made sure he knew that if there is any damage to his grass, you know anybody that like goes through their grass with like scissors. I mean, he's kind of like one of the, if there was any damage we will fix it we will take out trash and everything when it's done but I also wanted to make sure that he knew he and his wife were invited it was amazing how God blessed that conversation and his excuse was well I, I've been in severe back pain I, I said have you prayed about it no Can I pray with you? The last I heard from him, I saw him a few weeks later. He and his wife set up their lawn chairs just at the edge of the park in their yard, watching the service. And that's when I started hearing the news about Gary, how that pastor prayed for him and his back was healed. It wasn't me, that was God. 
Now, I, I continued to pray for Gary and his wife. They never showed up in church. But his nephew and his nephew's entire family, they did. Our God is a God of the impossible. I think of the countless parents over the years that I've prayed with and prayed for who time and time again have come to me saying, Pastor, I raised my kids in church. They have a relationship with Jesus they haven't attended for years. Deeply concerned as every parent should be for their children. And over and over and over again, I see the prayers of faithful parents answered as their children return. It may not be as quick as they like. Some, maybe not even in their lifetime. But over and over again, I've seen children return to worship God. I'm reminded of that this time of year as so many parents pray for their children and often they're lucky if if they see their children in church around Christmas and Easter. Don't give up. Keep praying. Our God is a God of the impossible. As we celebrate Palm Sunday this morning, we recognize that Jesus is the Christ. He's the prophesied Messiah. We recall just the many miracles that he performed, pointing to who he was and what his ministry was, pointing to the reality that he is the only begotten Son of God, pointing to to God's power, his care for his people, pointing to how God is the same God of the Old Testament, the New Testament, one true God, pointing to to the fact that God loves his children so deeply that he goes outside of natural law and things we understand to provide supernatural miracles. And when we look at the glorious entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, we have to remember the context with which it took place. We have to recognize the signs, the the miracles, the wonders that all heralded Christ. And when we consider the miraculous throughout Scripture, it, it really shows us and tells us many things as Christians. And this morning, I just want to hone in on three things that Scripture shows us about miracles. Three things that it tells us, three things that it encourages us with. You know, what, what do miracles show us? Well, first, miracles show us God's power and how he cares for us. Miracles are always intended to show people God's power and how he cares for them. Show people that that he is all powerful and that he is personal and he has a deep concern for each and every one of us. See on Palm Sunday Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. The crowds lined the streets recognizing the miraculous power of God at work. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, the people shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. See, the people, they recognized Jesus as the one who performed many miracles. It healed the blind, the lame, the sick, and they welcomed him as their Messiah. Because he performed the miracles and signs and wonders that God had prophesied would take place. And I just want to name a handful of miracles that that preceded Christ's entry into Jerusalem here on Palm Sunday. Water turned into wine at the wedding in Canaan. 
healing of the official's son, healing of the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda, feeding of the 5,000, walking on water, healing of the blind man, healing the woman with the issue of blood, healing of a deaf and mute man, feeding of the 4,000, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, healing of a man born blind, healing of ten lepers. And if you're in Matthew 21, you notice that right after Jesus' triumphal entry, it's bookended with another miracle. In verse 21, or chapter 21, verses 14 and 15, Jesus heals the blind and lame that are in the temple. These are people that were crying out to him as Christ. The blind and crippled people came to Jesus in the temple and Jesus healed them. The leading priests and teachers of the law saw that Jesus was doing wonderful things. They saw the children praising him in the temple. The children were saying, praise to the son of David. These people that knew he was the Christ, the prophesied Messiah. They saw the miracles firsthand, the signs and the wonders. They took it as a direct affirmation that Jesus is the Christ and every miracle in the New Testament points to that reality. But yet, there's also a group in that very same temple that when they saw the miraculous, they were angered. When they saw God's people healed, they were angry. I don't think things have changed too much even to this day. The same miracle that has Christians praising God is one that has others angered. In verse 15, to continue, it said, all these things made the priests and the teachers of the law very angry. Jesus was showing the people the very power of God. The miracles he performed were always to point to him as Christ. And all of his miracles in one form or another showed God's care and his concern for his people. I think of even in the Old Testament. All the miracles of the Old Testament were pointing to God's power and his care for his people. I think of, of the parting of the Red Sea, the provision of the manna, and the quail in the wilderness. You know, powerful miracles time and time again demonstrated God's power and his care for the Israelite people, even bringing water from, from a rock. Can you imagine Moses seeing signs and wonders and, and the miraculous work of God leading the people of Israel out of Egypt? And then coming to the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army bearing down on him. As God used the miraculous, parting the Red Seas. Do you think that was a visible display of his power to his people? Do you think they knew of their father's deep care and concern for them? As not only did he provide them a path where there was none, but later as Pharaoh's army would come after them, he closed the waters and defeated them. What do miracles show us? They show us God's power and his care for us. But miracles show us so much more. 
They don't just show us God's power and, and his care and concern for his people. Miracles also show us that he is one true God. He is the God of the Old Testament, the New Testament, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one true God. And this isn't an easy pill to swallow in our day and age. Does anybody uh, like to fly out of O'Hare? Isn't it the most wonderful airport to fly out of? Easiest too, right? I mean, they have terminals going everywhere around the world, don't they? They truly do. Now imagine for a moment that, that you're up there and you kind of get this objective look at this person that's throwing a fit because they want to buy a ticket, but they're trying to find the very cheapest one. And so they look around, and they're at the desk, and they're going from, from place to place, and finally the cheapest ticket they can find is a little hopper flight from, from O'Hare down here to Willard. So they get on the flight, they get here to Willard, and then when they get here, they throw a fit. And they're upset, they're angry, because they thought they were going to Sydney, Australia. Because... That's how it works, right? It, any plane and any terminal and any ticket will take you where you want to go. I mean, you, you laugh because that's how nonsensical it truly is, right? Yet we live in a day and age where all around we're bombarded by this message that whatever you believe, it gets you to the same place. God wanted to make it abundantly clear that he is the one true God. And there is none like him. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. All of his miracles point to that reality. Point to the Son having the power of the Father. Point to Jesus as the Christ. The Pharisees, they were, they were threatened by Jesus' popularity. They were threatened by his fulfillment of prophecy. And they accused him of blasphemy. But Jesus replied that even if the people did not shout out Hosanna, that the stones would cry out to proclaim his lordship. Look at Luke 19, verses 35 through 40. This is what Jesus said when the Pharisees confronted him. They brought it to Jesus and threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, People spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Jesus' miracles and triumphal entry into Jerusalem were a public declaration of his identity as the very Son of God, the Christ. And throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus' miracles, the signs and the wonders. And these are are reminiscent of the miracles performed by God in the Old Testament. The miracles of the Old Testament are foreshadows of, of the miracles that Christ would perform to come. I think of, of 2 Kings 5, where, where we read about Naaman, the Syrian commander, who has leprosy that's healed through the prophet Elisha. I think of the time where a prophet of God is, is running in, in need of sustenance and God tells him to go to the widow like we talked about last week and a, a widow that wouldn't have enough for herself and God provides for he and the widow and her family. I think of Exodus 14, verses 21 and 22, where Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Ultimately, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same one. 
and Jesus' miracles and his triumphant entry into Jerusalem were a public declaration of his identity as the one true God, as the Son of God. And the miracles that he performed pointed to that reality. And through his life and death and resurrection, Jesus proved, proved that God's love and power are just as relevant for us today as they were back then. As they were in the times of the Old Testament. And what, what do miracles show us? They show us so many things. They show us God's power. They show us his concern. They show us that he is the one true God. And if we can bring it home a little bit, miracles show God's love for his children. Miracles show God's love for you. It shows God's love for me. It shows God's love for us all. See, the people who gathered to welcome Jesus on Palm Sunday a large number of them were hoping for a political savior that would rescue them from Roman oppression. Let me just say that I've been alive through multiple presidential election cycles and I have to tell you that Christians are still praying for the same thing today. Jesus' purpose wasn't to establish an earthly kingdom. But to save humanity from sin and death. And then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. As Jesus wrote in Jerusalem, he knew. He knew exactly where he was headed. He was riding that donkey toward the cross where he would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. Now as we read through John's account of the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, John points to a prophecy that Jesus literally fulfilled. Every prophecy about Christ was literally fulfilled by Jesus. It's a prophecy we see from Zechariah 9 9. It says that the Messiah would come humbly riding on a donkey. Zechariah said this Everyone in Jerusalem, celebrate and shout. Your king has won a victory, and he is coming to you. He is humble and rides on a donkey, he comes on the colt of a donkey. See, the miracles of the Old Testament were all intended to rescue God's people from slavery, from oppression, from danger. And these miracles also proclaim God's lordship and his sovereignty over all things. But they demonstrate his deep love for his children. Maybe I could just ask you, did you know the thousands of years before your birth, God knew that you will be here in this very moment today. Or that you would be watching online. He knew. And God knew just what you need. Even back then, he knew what you would need. Sometime in eternity past, God knew that you would need extra strength so you wouldn't give up. God knew you needed a Savior so big that the entire universe couldn't hold him. God knew that you needed a Savior so tender and caring and loving that you could turn to him during your deepest times of pain and anxiety and suffering. Seven centuries 
before Jesus entered in to Jerusalem. The prophet Isaiah announced that God would send his son to this earth. He told us that a savior would be both powerful and personal. He'd be strong enough to save us, but he'd also be tender and loving. Most impressively, God tells us that Jesus would have a personal relationship with us. It's an amazing prediction. Look at Isaiah 40, verses 9 through 11. Shout louder, don't be afraid. Tell the cities of Judah your God is coming. Yes, the Lord is coming with mighty power. He will rule with awesome strength. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms and gently lead the ewes with young. And again, Isaiah didn't predict just Jesus' gentleness, but his enormous power. Verse 15, look. The nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are considered as a speck of dust in the scales. He lifts up the islands like fine dust. And then Isaiah got personal and he applied the coming of Jesus to our lives today. In verses 26 through 29, he said, Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? Who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what problems you're facing right now. I don't know what burdens you're bearing. I don't know what grief or fear or confusion that you are facing or will face. What you're feeling right now, but I know this. God's power and His care are showed for us time and time again throughout his miracles, throughout his signs and his wonders. They show us that he is the one true God and they show us that he loves us and he is here for us. Think of the problem that you've faced in your life. That's required the power of God. Maybe it's something you're struggling with right now. How did that experience draw you closer to God? How is it drawing you closer to God? I think of the parent praying for the prodigal. Keep praying. The spouse praying for the marriage to mend. Keep praying. The one praying for healing. Keep praying. The one praying for the impossible. Keep praying. Sometimes our, our wonderful God answers our prayers with a no. Sometimes it's a not yet. Keep praying. Sometimes it's yes. Our God is the God of the impossible. Will you trust your powerful God? Would you please pray with me? Father, as we come to you now, 
We thank you so very much for the precious blood of Christ. Father, by his triumphal entry into this world and into our lives, through the working of many signs, miracles, and wonders, by his death, his burial, and his resurrection, Father, we know that he is Christ. Father, as as we come to you now, around your table, as we partake of communion as one body, Father, we ask forgiveness. Forgiveness of where we fall short in thought and deed, the things that we should not do and the things that we don't do. God, we ask your forgiveness and we seek that. That we might be consecrated by the very blood of Christ shed for the covenant that forgives our sins. So as we come around your table, Lord, we might be in your grace anew. Father, we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.